like, fuck, you know, I was like, that shit hurt, that shit, I mean, it did kill me, it killed me, like, it killed all of us that day, when it happened. My name is Danielle Sanchez, and I am the widow of Marco Sanchez, who served in the Marine Corps for four years. When did you meet um, Marcos? I was, uh, I was eight years old, and um, he was 13, and he had came over to my aunt's house to, I guess, play video games. I'm not sure. I was playing. I didn't. I don't think they right. 13 year old boys play. But yeah. yeah. So, so <laughs> you guys lived in the same neighborhood. We lived, yeah, within two miles of each other. Um, and he lived within four houses from my aunt's house. Wow. So he came over because he was friends with one of your cousins? Or? Yeah, well, uh, he was friends with one of my cousins and then um, ended up playing football with my cousin and my brother uh, while they were all in high school together. Oh, wow. So it sounds like you, uh, you kind of grew up with him around all the time, huh? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I knew him um, from a very early age. Um, if I went to my Tia Lupa's house, nine times out of ten, he was there. And obviously, Marcos ended up going to the Marines? Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's correct. And um, did he go right after high school? or do you, do you... Uh, So, yeah. So, Marcos, from a very early age, said that he was probably about eight or nine and he wrote the Marine Corps saying he wanted to join the Marines and they wrote him back. Thank you. Uh, we love to have you, but contact us when you're 18. <laughs> <laughs> Marcos was part of the uh, uh, Operation Iraqi Freedom, right? Uh, yes, I yeah. believe it. The, yeah. The, and the, I, I, it says both on his yeah, yeah Operation yeah. Iraqi Freedom and Enduring Freedom. Yeah, yeah. So... Um, uh, yeah, he was part of the invasion, mm -hmm. and uh, obviously I know that because uh, we were in the same new together, 24th uh, uh, Marine Expeditionary Unit, Special Operations Capable. Um, did he ever talk to you about going overseas at all? So the number one thing that Marcos um, instilled in me and the boys is that the brotherhood that you guys had, right? Like he really emphasized on the Marine Corps brotherhood. Um, with us and with me and so the one thing I always knew that is that that is my family now <laughs> and if anything happens they will be there for you and to reach out to them mm. so um, he had told me that he told me the, that uh, that's all he ever wanted to do was be a marine and so when he finished that he was like I accomplished my life goal like that was the only thing I ever wanted to be when I grew up. Mm. And unfortunately, you know, him not being, um, kind of having some disabilities afterwards, uh, you know, he didn't want to do anything else. So that is what yeah. took a toll. <laughs> um, what type of disabilities did he have? Um, so he was currently on 13 different medications before he passed. Um, Biggest one was PTSD. Another one was um, he had a spinal injury uh, that was in the thoracic. So it's the like mid back, um, that constant chronic, always in chronic pain, constant chronic pain where there'd be days um, I'd have to leave him on the floor because his back would give out and I, I couldn't move him until basically, you know, there was like some time, but daily chronic pain and of course, with his chronic pain, it, with his physical pain, it messed with his mental health, and the mental health messed with the physical health. So it was a vicious cycle. Mm. Um, so I would venture to say you noticed some changes in Marcos from maybe before you knew him uh, joining the military compared to, you know, versus after when he came back. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. So, you know, before and I, I can't really say just because of the age gap difference of like that. But I could say that I do remember when I was 16 and, you know, he taught me how to stick shift. He was more of a happy go lucky guy. 
um, than when he did come back the, the second time I saw him. What role did you play in, um, you know, taking care of Marcos? Uh, what, would he, would he, was he good at taking his medications on his own or? Um, so it was a, it was about a good, let me see if he got out. It was a good decline, I guess, of his, from when he got out to, to the very end. Um, he was pretty good, you know, still obviously physically fit when you get out and working through some of his, uh, some of his things. I know when he first came home, he couldn't sleep. <laughs> and so he was always up all night or constantly checking out the window. And this is just stories he would tell me because at the time we didn't live together. I was still in high school, but. Right. Mm. And um, what else? Oh yeah. So then like that. Um, so he had, yeah, so when he first came home, he was just always kind of like more alert on edge. Um, Hypertense. Yeah, uh, the, that's what he, he would tell me. Um, he still seemed like, you know, happy-go-lucky, like kind of like if everything was all right. Um, I did notice, well, not that, not that I noticed, but not like thinking back, you know, going back in my memory, like he did drink, he, you know, I saw him get pretty fucked up at my brother or my tia's house one time and, um, like that. But, um, I could just say that when we got together, um, I know I do, I did, there was night terrors yeah. and, um, um, then he would wake up and you could just see the remorse like on his face, like just, I'm sorry. Like I, I, you know, I was having a dream that I was like back over there and, and stuff. And I was, and I was like, Oh, it's okay. And he's like, no, it's not right. You know, like I'm going to go sleep on the couch and, um, it'd be a few nights like that at times. <laughs> so he would go sleep on the couch because he was afraid maybe he was going to hurt you. Yeah. Something. Exactly. Mm. Um, what was he? He was diagnosed uh, p with PTSD through the v VA. Yeah, he was, um, but not at first. The only thing for years he was only ten percent up until two thousand and I want to say two thousand and thirteen. Mm -hmm. That he actually was after. Yeah. Because it was 2013 because we said it took us 10 years to fight to get him his disability uh, with the VA. 10 okay. years to try to get it, them to take us seriously that he had problems and he needed help. They make it, yeah. they make every little process so frustrating, mm -hmm. right? Like, and I'm not, you know, obviously we're not here to bash the VA because like you said, right. there's a lot of good... Doctors. doctors there you know I've, I've run into it yeah yeah no yeah there's um there's good doctors it's just the process of um how it is how it's run and yeah <laughs> it's not easy and you know to have to go through a process like that is just uh, sometimes unbearable stress yeah it's it's mentally draining it was mentally draining on myself <laughs> and so i mean it wasn't, and sometimes I think like that was more mentally draining than actually dealing with my husband who had mental problems mm -hmm. just because it was trying to figure out just the process. I mean, and I get it. It's like everybody has their process of things, but it's just, it's an, <laughs> it's not an easy process. Right. Um, you know, him being on 13 medications and dealing with these physical disabilities and mental disabilities um, does the VA ever try to reach out to you or as a spouse, knowing that it might be difficult to uh, deal with some of the stuff on your end that he's dealing with? Yeah. So um, one of the great things that the VA did have, right, is called the uh, VA caregiving program. And when that first started, it was it was awesome. They uh, paid me a stipend, you know, and I got to stay home and take care of him um, and be able to take him to his appointments and it, it worked really well at first. And then 
it worked really well at first, and then the uh, within the last few years of his life, or a year or two of his life, um, they decided he didn't need it anymore. Like, he didn't need that much care, so they they cut my stipend, right? Like, so I was like, okay, well, I got to go back to work, like, you, you know, make some extra income. And Why did um, they feel like th- he didn't need it? I guess the they were getting tighter on. There's more people on the program, so that they are getting tighter on the program, and um, oh, so I could let me, uh, yeah. So they're getting tighter on the program, and um, I guess funds. I, don't, I mean, honestly, it always came down to funds. Um, fortunately, there was even a doctor that says, "Well, you know, your surgery is looked at as a counting number and." This, is it is it worth it to give you this surgery for how much it's going to cost us? Yes or no? Mm. So uh, honestly, it go, I, I I think it came down to funds, <laughs> um, and whatever was signed into law, I guess at that time, and they just basically said like, oh well, somebody that needs full time care, even though he was a hundred percent housebound, right? Somebody that needs full-time care is more like someone that's like bedridden or, you know, can't feed themselves or all that. Mm. Um, so you ended up having to go back to work because they stopped paying you to take, help take care of them? Yeah. And well, and they did specify like, oh, this is a stipend. Like, it's kind of like a thank you for, you know, taking care of your husband and stuff. But, you know, money helps regardless of whether it's a stipend or not. It's, mm-hmm. It helps. Um, it helps with the stress, the financial stress of, you know, trying to take care of somebody that's that needs the help and um, also paying, you know, everyday lives, kids, bills. <laughs> so what happened when you had to go back to work? Um, I noticed he didn't take his medication as much. Uh, I would go home and then all of them would still be filled. Um, where before I was like, if he didn't take it, I was pretty much like, oh, you forgot to take it. And then within like the hour or two, kind of. Um, he slept a lot more. Uh, he didn't go out as much. Um, I had him, like when I was home with him full time, I would make him like, okay, well, you need to come drop off the kids with me. You need to come to the grocery store. Let's go do this. You know, I, he wouldn't want to do it, but I would, you know, like, no, come on, let's go. Like, let's do this. And, you know, let's go outside or let's go to the, you know, just those type of things to encourage him to get out of the house too. And, uh, just, um, you know, like go to the grocery store. All right. Right now it's 10 o'clock. There's hardly anybody in the grocery store because big crowds would agitate him at times. So it'd just be all like, all right, what do you want to just, I guess, quality of life to give him that quality of life Mm -hmm. that he needed. Yeah. And so when, um, I, when I had to go back, the quality the quality of life wasn't there um, for him. Like, he, him doing those things on his own, he just wouldn't do. Mm. And take the initiative to do those type of things. Or go to his VA appointments um, on his own. He would just, oh, I was too tired. Or <laughs> I, I guess he, he would say, like, oh, why are you always cracking the whip? But it was like... And be all like, man, you know how long I spent on the phone trying to get this appointment for you? Yeah. <laughs> like, you better take your ass over there to go. <laughs> I was like, because I ain't doing this shit for nothing. <laughs> <laughs> and so then he was like, fuck, all right. <laughs> and then, yeah, so. Um, but then he would tell me, like, no, I appreciate it, like, that you do do those, these little things for me. And, like, you know, you do try to make me go out when I'm not feeling it and and stuff like that so but that them taking away that really did affect um really did affect his quality of life and they would have every three months a nurse would come in and you know they were just kind of they wouldn't really like they would talk to him and then me privately and like how are you managing stress do you feel this and I would always tell them like no like do you feel unsafe with him or anything and I was like no if anything like I feel safe with him um I just, I would go out for walks, like if I needed my alone time, because since we were always kind of together or, you know, do other little things, take the boys to, um, take the boys to, um, whatever practice they had and Mm -hmm. stuff. But I would, 
definitely. Um, they would give me a questionnaire in order to say, well, was I able to handle the stress yeah. of that? Because it is a stressful situation. Mm. Um, so they were checking on you too? Yeah, they were checking. They were, I mean, yeah, they were checking. They were asking me the questions, right. you know, of, on a scale from one to ten. Right, right. <laughs> <laughs> How stressed do you feel on any given day? And it's like, well, today's great, you know. Mm. I haven't had this one, but I mean, that's... It's hard to say, even say that on everyday life stress. So right. I just, um, but they would check on, yeah, they would check. And, you know, I don't know if it was too, because the areas we live in, you know, thinking like, well, they got like, a, you know, a nice house. And, you know, look like a nice little family. Like, yeah. does he really need this help? Mm. I kind of felt like at times, like, yeah, I was good getting judged on that and especially that he looked like he was perfectly fine right and but i mean internally <laughs> um so you were you trying to get back to full-time care like to oh yeah i so that was another thing too i would i wrote a pills after a pills um they taught and then they would write back like oh he doesn't need it and then took it like till as high as he could have hit it and um they basically had said no um he does not he does not um qualify for that type of care anymore mm. um so you know it's hard when you get something and then they take it back and then they say like well it seems like he's doing better and it's like well don't you think he's doing better because of what's changed right right of me taking care of him and me helping him through his daily, his, just his daily life with his mental health and just, and stuff. I mean, I know he didn't, he didn't, he was an amputee or anything like that, but you know, um, being in physical chronic pain all the time, you know, barely being able to walk or want to get out of bed at times yeah. was stress and it's, um, and mental health. Yeah. That's, that's... That is, and that's what it was. It, it, it really came down to his mental his mental health of and he did better when you were there with him yeah he did better and you know there was those times too um because i would have i would have to check him into psych ward after he would have as time got worse i wasn't able to calm the monster in him and so once he would get calm uh, and the va in long beach has a psych ward and i would go and I would be able to at least calm him enough to convince him to go there. And, you know, they're all like, oh, um, do you try the VA suicide hotline? You know, and he's done that a, a few times, but um, it wasn't really a thing kind of right before. It, was, it still was new in the works. It's still, <laughs> yeah. and it wasn't never that uh, he wanted to kill himself. Uh, it was more... I was always afraid that he was going to hurt somebody else just because how irate and then he would get and see um, and just, yeah, just, you know, somebody messed with him, cut him off in traffic, <laughs> mm. you know, just looking um, to always, I guess, pick a fight when he was upset, like just wanted somebody to pick a fight with him. Right. Um. Can you walk us through what happened uh, on the last day, I guess, you seen him alive? Um, yeah, oh, I could actually tell you about two weeks before he passed away. Um, uh, before he passed away, death by suicide. I was fighting with the nurse because I was trying to change my, like I said, with the caregiver program. And I was telling him, look, he needs to go to a men's trauma center. Well, that's like six months. And I was like, I just feel there's something, you know, because it's gotten worse that like that whole year. I just feel like he's going to hurt somebody. And like something, I was like, something in my gut was just telling me. And I was like, he needs help. Like, 
you see, uh, he goes, checks in for three days and you release him back to me, which is fine, but he needs more than three days in there. Like that's just voluntary him going, you know? Mm -hmm. And yeah, they asked me like, do you feel safe for him to come back? Like after what happened? And it's like, no, I'm fine. Like I feel safe. Like, you know, I, I'm not, I'm not afraid of him. Like, I know like he has mental problems. He has, you know, stuff that's going on in his head that he has no control of. And so, like, they would bring him back. Um, but it was always just kind of like that same cycle, vicious cycle. And I was telling the caregiver nurse at the time, I was like, he needs somebody, like, or he needs to be checked into, like, a men's trauma center. I know the VA in Palo Alto has one now. Mm -hmm. And there is, like, another one down south. I can't remember the name. Um, but... Even then, I was like, oh, well, that's six months or this, that, you know, the, like the, the same story you always get. There's a waiting list. Mm. There's, there's, no, there's no room. Well, we could put you on because the VA started to do, I can't remember, what is it called? Like an outsource, but you still had to get it approved. Like third party? Yeah, yeah. third party, yeah. And, um, but you still had to get it approved. Mm. And that took months. <laughs> For them to like, oh, prove or find somebody to, so you could get an appointment or whatever. Um, but yeah, so I had told, I had told the nurse that, um, I just feel that something's going to happen. You know, he's kind of had some issues and he's had some like little fights with like, you know, his brothers, you guys and, and stuff. Um, little, like little, I don't know if you call them misunderstanding, whatever yeah. <laughs> you guys would have um and just and then he would apologize and make amends and stuff but it was just like stuff where it was it was you know he got really upset about uh, little things and and she's like oh yeah well again you know he just he doesn't need that type of care like you know what what we give you and stuff and it's like okay well fine not don't give me the money but put him someplace because something's gonna go down and then sure enough, uh, I would say like two, three weeks later, um, I come home from work, I'm tired, you know, he ends up having like a, a stomach virus or something. Keanu has a game that, a soccer game that night, so I'm trying to get him and I'm running around. Um, he's getting sick, so I'm trying to also clean up his stuff, you, you know, and and I was like, oh, you want me to stay? And he's like, oh, no. Like, go ahead, go. Um, I was like, oh, okay. I called my dad in the morning because my dad was supposed to come into town. So that's why I had, like, was kind of running around. But I was like, look, Dad, Marcos has a stomach virus. And I know you got, like, this wedding to go to, like, the next week. I don't think you want to be around because he was just getting sick. So all that morning or, yeah, all that day, he didn't have any of his medication either. Um and, you know, with the stomach virus, it's highly contagious. So I was like, I'm not trying to get sick. Like, I need to work. The kids need to go to school. Mm -hmm. So I was there cleaning up. But I guess I was being a little OCD for his liking that day. And um, because when he got out of the restroom, I went in there and cleaned up. Like, I sprayed stuff like Lysol. And he's like, can you fucking not do that? He's like, that's so fucking annoying. He's like, leave it alone. We only have one bathroom, so I mean, I have to clean the bathroom up after him, and um, and it just and I was like, you know, I was like, I'm sorry, I was like, I'm not trying to annoy you, I was like, I just feel right now, I feel a little overwhelmed, and you know, I'm trying to get Keanu ready uh, to go because he really wants to go to a soccer game, you know how little kids are when they're all excited and um, and all that, and he's like, and I was like. What did I say? Something. I can't even remember what I said. But I just remember cleaning and him just yelling at me, right? And I'm just telling him, like, I'm not trying to upset you. Like, please let me just clean this up. Like, you know, go back, lay down and stuff. And, um, and he's like, why? Uh, he's like, why don't you just fucking listen to what I say? He's like, fucking leave it. And so, like, I was like, you know what? Fine. So I dropped it. I was like, I'll leave it. I was like, I, I don't have time for this right now. Like, I'm sorry. And, um, and I left and I went 
to the boys' room and he followed me and he, uh, okay, so he followed me and he grabbed my hair and he threw me on the bed. And I was like, please don't. I was like, I'm trying to take like the kids and Aiden was on the top bunk and Keanu, I, can't, I don't remember, I can't remember where Keanu was. And he, and um, he's like, you don't fucking listen to what you're supposed to do. He's like, he's like, are you my wife or are you my fucking caregiver? You know? And I was like, dude, that's really unfair of you to say that. I, I you know, flirted a, a very thin line. And I was like, please. I was like, I just want to leave. And then he, and he's like, and then so then he grabbed me by the arm and then he's like, all right. He's like, and then we went to my room, right? And he threw, uh, he not threw, but he shut the door all crazy. And I'm just like, dude, I don't, I was like, I can't help you. Granted, I was already feeling that stress because I was, had been fighting with the VA recently telling him like, I don't know how much more I could help him. Like I'm at my wits, like I'm no longer good to him anymore. I need help. I need, I need you guys to help, help me. And and at that time, I was just like, you know what, I'm done. Like, I can't, I can't do it anymore. Like, I'm sorry. And I was like, please, Marco. So I was like, let's, let's go to, you know, let, um, let me, let me help you. Like, let me check you, you know, like, let's go to the VA or something. Like, if I know you're not feeling well, I know you had like the stomach and all that, um, you've been throwing up and just that stuff. And I was like, oh, I know it's hard for you. I, about the medication, and then that's when he's like, you and the fucking medication, everybody and their fucking medication, always trying to fucking, the pills, and then they don't even fucking want it, and he just went off on, you know, whatever he was saying on those pills, um, and so then I was just like, I'm sorry, and he had me trapped, like, I couldn't get out, right, and so when I was like, and I was scared, I'm not even gonna lie, I was scared, because, um, Anytime I would try to go out, like he would hit me at that point. And, um, and he's like, you're not fucking going anywhere. Pulled, you know, pulled me by my hair, top of my head. And I was like, please, I was like, leave me. I was like, please let me just take the kids. The kids are scared. Like, let's think about the kids. Cause he would always say afterwards too, like his moments, like his children are his everything. So that's kind of where I'd always be able to get him that you know, that other side of them click. I was like, think about your kids. Like, come on, think about the boys and, um, and stuff. And, and he's like, no, fuck that. He's like, I'm fucking tired of all this shit. He's like, I'm fucking done. And I had my phone, um, on the floor. Cause at that point I was on the floor and he, um, and I was shaking and I looked at my phone and I was like, fuck dude, like, I don't know what else to do but call 911, right? And so he saw me, like, kind of reach for my phone, and he got it, and, he, and, and he's like, what are you going to fucking do, call 911? He's like, I'm going to fucking kill you if you do, right? He's like, I'll fucking kill you in front of the fucking kids. And so then, like, of course, I, I was scared. And, um, and so then I was like, oh, no. And... So I didn't want to, I didn't touch it after that point. And so, um, so then I don't know how, I, I don't remember from the point, right, of me being able to let, get out of the room. But I just, I do remember he finally, like, I, after begging with him, like, please let me out. Like, I, I don't feel safe. Like, please, I'm scared. Um, he let me out. And I, I ran to the house phone and dialed 911. And I was like, please, I need help. Like my husband, my husband's having a moment. And, um, and I was like, he's a PTSD veteran and all that other stuff. And um, he needs help. And, and he looked at me and he's like, I'm going to fucking kill myself now. And I was like, he just told me he was going to kill himself. And, uh, and stuff, and then she's like, well, do you have a gun in the house? And I was like, not that I know of, and stuff. I was like, I know that, like, we have a BB gun, you know, that he had, because he was teaching the boys, like, you know, how to kind of do a scope thing, and, 
and all that. And, um, and so, yeah, he ran off and she's like, ma'am, where is he? And I was like, I don't know. I'm on a house phone. Like we had a house phone cause he wouldn't answer his cell phone. So sometimes that's how I'd get a hold of him. But I, I was like, I don't know, like the phone's attached. It's not like a cordless. And, um, yeah, that's that, that she was saying that. And so like he ran out and, um, he had a uh, ran out and, uh, and they were like, well, where is he? I don't know. And then he had came back inside and he's like, he's like, this is, he's like, he's like, fuck you. You know, like he ran from the, from the outside door, it's the living room where the phone is, but ran out this, uh, from the door and, um, I saw the gun in his hands and I saw him go, I saw him go to the boys' room and says, and he said, I love you, right? I, I only know that because that's what the boys had told me. But I would, after, um, he had ran in there, told him whatever he had told him, because like I told you in the beginning, my boys knew when dad acted up, they go hide in the room. So he had ran in there, um, came back out, I was still on the phone and and I remember looking at him and I'm like, please, like, don't, don't do this. Like, don't do this. Like, please, like, come on, let me help you. Like, I'm just trying to help you. Like, like, I'm just trying to help you. And he's like, no, fuck that. He's like, this is what you fucking wanted. He's like, this is what you're going to fucking get. And, and he, um, it was death by suicide. He shot himself in the head while I was on the phone with the 911 trying to get him help. So, um, that had happened and I screamed and I went into that fight or flight mode and freaking just grabbed, I, I mean, I don't know if there was a towel next to me, how I got a towel in my hand. Um, I freaking went over to him and, and was trying to hold the wound, you know, so like, cause blood was getting all over my carpet and I remember going back and I must have hung up the phone because I had to redial 911 or maybe I didn't I don't know but I remember like where are they like because they had told me cops are on the way it's been a long time like my husband just shot himself like uh I put it on speaker and then I was like please like help me like where is somebody, you know, like I was like waiting on police. I was like, he just shot himself and I don't know. It felt like eternity. It could have probably been like two minutes before they got there, but it felt like eternity, like hearing the sirens in the background and, um, and, uh, just, yeah, they, you know, they, they rushed him in and, um, they, they took him away and they were asking me questions and, um, you know, they had asked, you know, like anybody else in the house. And I was like, my kids are locked in their, locked in the bedroom. Well, not locked, but you know, they're in the bedroom with the door shut. I was there. So they sat, sat me down and they were asking me all these questions and they're all like, is he on any medication? And we had like, I was like, it's this bag over here. And it's just like a, a tote bag that was just filled with his medications. I was like, he's like, they're all what medications. I was like, I can't name them all 13. Like, I don't even know how to pronounce half of these names. I just know, you know, which ones do what. And, um, yeah, they end up taking him like that. And that's kind of how it went down. And after that, I mean, it was a whole nother, um, scene of things, you know, it was at that point a crime scene, um, yeah. where, um, where I'm sorry, I got really elevated on my right. um, where um, where the cri crime scene, you know, they had the investigation. Of course, you know, they asked where the gun was and if I touched the gun. And um, I remember, I remember the, I remember one of the officers telling me. Well, where'd the second bullet go? And I was like, he fucking shot himself, asshole. You know, how the fuck does he shoot, does someone shoot themselves twice? And I mean, I got what he was doing at his job, but I was like, what the fuck? Like, dude, you see me fucking covered in blood? Like, 
fuck, dude, my kids are in the fucking room. They heard that shit. And fuck, now that I think about it, when he shot himself, my boys were in the room and my oldest came out because he heard the gunshot. And, you know, and I was on the thing. And that's what I remember is that I, that when Aiden came out, Keanu also came out with him. And I was there with Marcos. And I think that was a point where I was there holding the thing. And I said, get back in your fucking room and don't fucking come out until I tell you. And all I can remember is hearing Aiden also in the fucking background saying, no, 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 my God, no, my God. You know, like, no, why me, why me? I could hear Keanu crying. And now that I think about it, I remember telling him, like, dude, you fucking survived through war. Like, please survive through this. Like, you know, I mean, fuck, I thought, you know, be the 99 or be the 1% that fucking gets a bullet in their head and fucking survives, you know, like, and stuff. That was like my hope. <laughs> and, um, yeah, so then that, that was like, uh, fuck, you know, with my kids, like doing that, it just, that's why I was so angry. Like, fuck, dude, you eat at that fucking officer is that like, what the fuck you think I did this shit? Like, you think I wanted my, you think I wanted to see that? Mm -hmm. You think I wanted my kids to see that? Like, like, fuck, you know, <laughs> like that shit, that shit, I mean, it did kill me. It killed me. Like, it killed all of us that day when it happened. And I, and, and I, I remember them, um, I remember when the cop caught me and after like another officer caught me, I remember, um, the, his phone and I was like, oh my God, uh, like your guys' chat line. <laughs> and, and I was, cause they were like, do you have help? And I was like, no, like none of my family lives down here. Everybody lives in Northern California. And remember in the beginning when I said the one thing Marcos instilled on us is that if anything ever happened is to reach out to you guys so that was the first that was the first thing I did I was like when they asked me like who could help you it was that I hit the chat line from his phone mm. and um I mean you I know you remember this, uh, I don't uh, uh I don't even know what I put I just put like Fuck, Marco shot himself in the head or something. You know, I don't even know if it even made sense. Um, no, you said, I remember because I was in New York. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, Letty and I was in New York. And <clears throat> I remember I was watching a postseason Dodger game. And I had to go upstairs to the room uh, to go to the bathroom. And, uh, and I jumped on the phone to see what uh, was going on in the chat. And I remember seeing a text from Marcos' phone. Uh, and it said, hey, this is Danielle. Um, Marcos just shot himself. And, you know, we're in a group chat with like 15 to 20 Marines at any one given time. And you don't know what to believe in that thing. People are, you know, we're, we're brutal in there sometimes, you know. And I remember... I think I remember replying something like, you know, that's not, it's not nothing to play around with. Like, I, I hope this isn't a joke. Like, I mean, I hope it's a joke, but it, this is right. not something to joke about. And so I remember calling you right away. And, um, I, rem I remember that like, Josh, I'm not joking. Please tell them I'm not joking. Like, yeah, I, you could barely talk to me. Like, yeah. you were crying. You could barely get words out of your mouth. Um, and I remember you were telling me, you know, you were trying to. Yeah. You were trying to help him. You know, you were trying to, you are trying to save him. Mm-hmm. I just, I, I, I know, I, I, I remember just talk, one thing too, like that's, I mean, fuck. I remember saying, I'm sorry, I can't say, I did, I couldn't save your brother. Cause you know, that was just, you know, I just, it was hard. I it was, it became to that point of, 
I was pushed against the wall with not getting help that he needed, you know, him and not getting him the proper help and what I knew at the time too, you know, I, I and stuff and just always trying to educate myself on his PTSD and everything and trying to just stay like, okay, he's not acting this way because he's a bad person, you know, or he's not being this way because he is a like, you know, he's choosing like, no, like these are some serious issues that he has, uh, that he has that uh, stem from, stem from war, you right. know, like that has stemmed from combat and um, that, that he needs help with and what would you say to a, a, a spouse that might be dealing with something like this um, you know would you be able to give he or she any type of piece of advice you know dealing with a veteran spouse that is suffering from uh, mental health um, the advice that I would give is that you know you're not alone that's probably the biggest thing is that you're not alone because there were times where I did feel alone because nobody understood my story. Mm -hmm. Nobody got what, like, I lived through on a daily. You know, like, you hear people like, oh, me and my husband had this type of fight or, you know, the, those or this, and you hear everybody, like, the other type of marriages, but you don't ever hear about, you know, the combat vet ones and the ones that, like, from war and... and um, you know, doing like that. So you kind of feel isolated, like they, they don't understand because then you tell them and then people are like, oh my God, what the fuck? Like, you need to leave him, you know? And it's like, hold up, hold up. Like, I don't need to leave him, like, and stuff. Like, oh, you shouldn't be put in that situation. It's like, okay, yes, I, I shouldn't be put in that situation, but he really does need help. Like, that's you know, I, uh, and stuff. It's like, it's not that he's doing this because fuck, he's a monster. Like, no, this is because it solely stems from, you know, what he had to do in order to come back and try to live this normal life again, which was never, ever going to be normal. And, um, it's unfortunate that, you know, people, um, that it's because it's taboo to talk about and it's mm -hmm. been taboo to talk about or, you know, and then, and, or even to say certain things where it feels like, oh, I can't say, I can't say that out loud. Like, it's like, I don't know, whatever code of, or like how they say, it's like, oh, it's something you just don't talk about. You don't want to keep it hush. You know, like if you talk about your, be you're being, be you're betraying, um, yeah. certain things that go on. And, uh, so then you kind of feel alone in that. <laughs> mm -hmm. Because it's like, you know, it's not talked about. Right. And then, yeah. Which is, which is why it's really important to sit down and, and tell this story. You know, right. because I guarantee you there's other spouses out there that want to get a lot of things off their chest. Yeah. And they just don't know who to talk to. And, and, you know, the fortunate part, too, is that with the VA, like, I get... a those people are doctors. They don't, they're, you know, it's very odd that there's someone at the VA that's actually been through everything. And those are the ones that are the good ones at the VA. The ones that, you know, they are like, I know I did this, this and that, and this happened to me and I overcame and all this other stuff. Um, and I served this. And, um, I remember once Marcos had a nurse and he was actually, um, I forget, I have a business card somewhere, but um, he ended up moving, but he was doc. And so then, like, he's like, oh, the nurse that would come to my house. And he was like, he was great, you know. And mm. Marco said I felt the safest talking always to him when he would come. Mm. Um, but, yeah, he was like, oh, he's like, oh, you were doc. And he's like, yeah, like, he started laughing. I, um, What is that, like a medic right Can, yeah yeah like a navy one right yeah, yeah. like uh, we always had a corpsman attached to our yeah you know, so that uh, yeah they were always they're always considered one of us yeah you know? that's what he said he goes oh you're actually one of me <laughs> that's mm -hmm. exactly what he said but i just remember he was like oh you're doc <laughs> like mm -hmm. that's who you are yeah that, yep and so then that that just stuck within my yeah. head of like oh that's doc like yeah yeah. So like yeah, they, like he's like he's like yeah, you're the, like the only ones we respect. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, 
Uh, but. Um, earlier you had said that Marcos had mentioned to you that if anything ever happened to him, um, you could always go to his his brothers, mm -hmm. um, uh, meaning you know his his, his brotherhood, his yeah, brothers and stuff. And um, how's that held up for you since he's been gone? Oh, since day one, if I, I mean, it could be from a late night phone call where I'm, I'm like, what am I doing? I'm a, I'm a widow. I have two kids. I've never lived on my own. I got with Marcos, you know, right out of high school, and stuff, and. Um, you know, got married, got kid, had kids, <laughs> everything. I was 19 when I had my first one. So, you know, at 32 years of age was the first time I've ever been out on my own. And I got two, two kids to raise. Mm -hmm. And so, um, yeah, like, so, you know, from, a, like I said, like a late night phone call or just little things that I need fixed around the house, you know, or, um, Probably just anything. You, I mean, you guys still been here since day one. Since I, since I text you saying I needed help, even that night, uh, Mike and Adam came out, and so no hesitation, no nothing. Took me to, you know, like it, it is phenomenal. I mean, honestly, like I am grateful for you guys. Like and well. Um, like, yeah, I, I mean, I can't just, I can't, I, it's so hard because I know people don't have that, but it's like, you guys are my family. Like my, my kids know you as their Marine Theos, yeah, <laughs> you know, <yeah. laughs> and so they're Marine uncles and, you know, some of the other ones, um, some of the, you know, the, oh, those are my Marine cousins Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and within like, you know, the, the other family, the Mendez family. And so. Right. And it will be like that forever. Yeah. As long as we're around, like, it will always be like that. And you know? even before I really even knew you guys, he had always said, like, you reach out to these people. Like, if you need anything, you reach out to these people. I mean, he, even you guys even helped me so much as far as, like, the funeral services and, you know, doing all those things. And mm -hmm. it was really hard, too, because, um, you know, I did talk about it in the beginning, but I had to separate myself from my family and his family, just because of how his mental health was like, and they just didn't, they just didn't get it and they didn't understand. And they're just like, and you know, and it's like, oh, and that's fine. You know, it's hard. Don't get me wrong. It's extremely hard to deal with a person um, with mental illnesses. And I mean, the physical part too. And so, um, you know, and if, and they felt unsafe and that's understandable and so like but I wasn't I wasn't gonna leave my husband you know I I knew like I felt safe with him I felt okay with him like um and if I gotta separate myself from you guys like I understand mm -hmm. I understand that like there's no heart feel, feelings it's just but just understand like I can't do I can't be both either because um it really hurt him too, mm -hmm. like to felt like, well, fuck, everybody thinks I'm this monster. I might as well be this fucking monster. You know, it's like if you're being blamed for something, it's like I might as well do it because like nobody believes, nobody believes me. Nobody thinks I'm, I'm this, you know. And right. so when you feel like you're this person or have people make you feel like you're this person, well, I remember him just saying like, well, fuck it. I'm just going to be this person now. Mm. Like nobody... Everybody thinks I'm a monster. Well, fuck, I'm going to be a monster. And I just be all like, no, like, just people don't understand, you know, and try to talk to him and, yeah, and stuff. And, and I was like, not everybody's going to get it. And it's unfortunate, you know, but as time goes on and hopefully more and more people get it. And that's why I've never been, I guess, a, kind of in a sense to be afraid to talk about it because I've always kind of, even with my other friends um at times I had to just say like my husband's a vet <laughs> like he's very passionate about his country you know he's it comes off in a way he's a marine and stuff it may come off as like I guess a drill instructor at times but it's like he's just is that's who he is I mean he's a marine 
once a Marine, always a Marine. So that's not going to mm. die with him just because he stopped serving his country. Oh, that's a perfect way to end it. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to wrap it up. Um, running out of battery here, but... Uh... Thank you, Danielle. Thank you for being here and telling the story. You're going to impact a lot of veterans and spouses. So Yeah, I hope. And anytime you want me back, I mean, just let me know. <laughs> Got more questions? <laughs> <laughs> Thank Got you. a lot to answer. <laughs> Thank you. Uh-huh. Push it to the limit, I can't go no more. Red light, no way I'm coming back home. Long dirt road all on my own. I'm going to be the greatest, draw my name in stone. Remember